Um, welcome everyone to the um, IHR Latin American History Seminar. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Christine Mathias, one of the conveners of the seminar. Um, and we're very fortunate today to have um, two guests who are both uh, experts on the history of Guatemala. I'm sure it's gonna be a really interesting discussion. Um, so we'll be talking with Julie Gibbings, who's a lecturer in the history department at the University of Edinburgh about her new book, um, which we'll say more about in just a minute. Um, and we're very fortunate to have in conversation with Julie, Rachel Nolan, who's a journalist and historian, assistant professor of international relations at Boston University. Um, so I'll turn things over to Rachel to get the discussion started. Thank you so much and thanks for the invitation to join all of you. We will be talking about this beauty. I hope you can see it. Our time is now race and modernity in post-colonial Guatemala. I'm going to introduce the book extremely briefly for those who haven't already read it or don't know about it or don't know much about Guatemala and then we'll get right into the conversation. Um, the first thing I want to say is that this is an extraordinary book based on truly virtuoso archival research. So of course the first thing that you're looking for as a historian is uh, is there original material? What, what is the archival uh, record here? And, and I, I just want to highlight that doing archival research in Guatemala can present even more challenges than doing it in other places. Um, I know that can be true throughout the region, but Guatemala, um, particularly if you are trying to do research outside of the capital, outside of Guatemala City or Antigua or some of the more um, obvious places to do research, Quetzaltenango, the second city of Guatemala, the kind of capital of indigenous life there. And Julie has really given us a completely different perspective from a very important region called Alta Verapaz, um, the capital of which is Coban which was settled um, by not just um, a mixture of uh, Maya peoples. So of course, for those who don't know, there are 22 um, indigenous uh, groups who speak 22 different languages in Guatemala. Um, they make up roughly half of the population. There's always been a debate over whether they're undercounted, overcounted. But the important thing to know to discuss this book is that like Bolivia or Peru, Guatemala is the other place where there's a significant indigenous population. And so the indigenous group that Julie is talking about here are called Kekchi. Um, and this is a unique region because it was settled not just by Spaniards, of course, as part of the conquest, but later, in the 19th century by Germans who were looking to um, cultivate coffee on plantations. And so one of the major innovations that Julie is bringing in this book is to bring in Kekchi actors, not just as a kind of inclusionary gesture, but to really grapple with their notions of time and his historical movement alongside um, the notions of time and modernity and historical movement of settlers, be they, um, Ladino, Ladino in the Guatemalan context just means non-Indigenous. It's usually people of mixed um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous background. I know that can be confusing for those who have not been to Guatemala or read about it extensively. Um, so she's kind of narrating both from, insofar as the documents allow, both from a settler perspective, but also from a Kekchi perspective. Um, the other thing that we were discussing right before we got on the camera, and then I'll start asking the questions, is that the, the real innovation here is too often Guatemalan history is understood backwards through its most violent moment. So we read the violence of the past through the genocide um, that was part of the 36 year civil war from 1960 to 1996. We read back through the uh, Maya genocide of the 1980s. And while it's important to understand the roots of the genocide, that's not the only lens that we need to um, understand Guatemalan history and its longer trajectory. And one of the things that this book so convincingly does is situate um, ethnic conflict and alliance, not just as a matter of Ladino versus Maya locked in some kind of eternal ahistorical structure, but rather a series of strategic alliances, mediations, conflicts that we can analyze and understand um, in a more nuanced sense. So that's my brief introduction to the book for those who uh, haven't had a chance to read it yet. It's truly wonderful. I want to congratulate Julie. It's, it's fantastic. So to get started with the conversation, I wonder if you'll just tell us a little bit about who you are, how you came to the subject, we were chatting before this began and you mentioned that dengue fever had something to do with how you ended up in Alta Vera Paz. So if you wanna discuss the kind of conjunction of the academic and personal that leads you to a project, I'd love to hear it. 
Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of funny. Um, one of the decision making processes that happened with this book manuscript was, you know, this what Rachel was mes mentioning, and, and thank you for those really, really generous comments. Um, and when I was doing my master's thesis research um, up in the Peken, which is the Northern Lowlands, um, I uh, got very sick with dengue fever. And that was one of the reasons that I decided ultimately that I didn't want to work on the Peken for the dissertation. And I began searching out for other regions. Um, but on a more intellectual kind of level, I also became fascinated by this region in Alphabet, this region Alphabet Pass, which is located in so northwestern part of the country, because I discovered that um, there was this the, the wife of an ex-military general during the Guatemalan genocide, Benedito um, Lucas Garcia's wife, um, was a mixed race Kekchi German woman um, named Marta Elena Winter. And she spoke in, you know, she dressed in indigenous clothing, she spoke Kekchi, she participated in indigenous cultural religious life, and she was, yet yeah, she was married to this genocidal general. And she almost operated as like sort of the right wing version of Rigoberta Menchu. And I was really fascinated by like the, the interracial mixing component of it, of the question. And as I began to sort of ask more people about it, about this interracial mixing between German settlers and Kekchi people, I, you know, heard a lot of, a lot of different stories, but particularly also was fascinated by how they identified themselves um, and were identified as la raza mejorada, the improved race. Um, quite literally. And that was even, you know, in the, the early 2000s. And so even more than that, I kind of was fascinated by how these histories of German settlement um, were very much ignored within the literature, um, even though by the 1930s, they controlled the vast majority of coffee productive land in the region and two thirds of coffee exports. Um, and Alta Vera Pass itself was also just this really fascinating place because it was this large indigenous frontier region. Um, in the colonial period, it was seen as this kind of cultural backwater. Um, but then by the mid 19th century, late 19th century, it becomes um, this hope for racial whitening and modernity based on German immigration and coffee production. And so it becomes this kind of laboratory uh, um, so to speak, for racial whitening and progress. And I was just totally fascinated by that story. And I wanted to think about how that region could help us to understand Guatemala a little differently and understand how you get um, a Kekchi German woman who's married to a genocidal military general um, at the same time. Um, yeah, so that's basically, you know, and there was also the personal dimensions of like wanting to move away from the political period and also <laughs> not work in the big tent for a fever. So right. I, was, I was searching out the healthy climate, just like the Germans. <laughs> so now that you've brought up the, these kind of um, vexed or complicated racial questions in the region, I'm wondering if you could talk about a term that you use, that you introduced in the introduction, um, which is the politics of postponement. And if you could tell us what you mean by that and what are the kind of interlocked racial understandings of the Kekchi as we move through the late 19th century into the early 20th century? Yeah, so the, the idea of the politics of postponement um, was very much um, worked out in relationship to Deepesh Chakrabarty's work um, on, you know, history as the not yet, right? That gets art articulated to you, a lot of post-colonial nations. Um, as a way of limiting um, participation or citizenship within the nation. And it was partly because I wanted to understand how it was that race and modernity, um, a political modernity and citizenship are interconnected. So that the problem with race in the 19th century and early 20th century was not so much just that people were different and that the state needed to manage difference, but that it did it so via time. It did so via categorizing people according to different uh, categories um, that were temporal categories. Um, and so the politics of postponement became a way for me to articulate how those questions of racial difference got linked up to um, questions of citizenship and inclusion in the nation. And I think it's a really sort of 
potent way of understanding this sort of post-colonial predicament that a lot of countries find themselves within. And it's almost, you know, ubiquitous. Once you begin to think in those terms, you see it everywhere. Um, but it's really important, especially for Guatemala, because as Rachel was saying, it is a majority indigenous population. And if you're consigning the majority of your population to the so-called waiting room of history, to the not yet of citizenship, then you're talking about a profoundly undemocratic and exclusionary place where a lot of people's desires and political demands are being um, foreclosed. And in that sense, I think it was also, it's also very helpful for understanding Latin America's 20th century um, in both terms of its, uh, its you know, the ubiquity of, of populist dictatorships and revolutions. Um, because I think it helps to understand the appeal of populists um, and how it is when um, a populist reach out to urban and rural poor to offer them justice, for example, to promise to bring modernization, land and roads, um, to give them someone to identify with and someone who um, they identify. That it's not the question of being booped, it's about taking the chance to articulate their political demands that have been so long foreclosed and to articulate them not necessarily in the way that, that, the, that a populist or um, populist leader wants. And likewise with revolution, um, you know, if you think about revolutionary time, it is, it is kind of like a response to the politics of postponement. And, mm -hmm. and again, pushing those demands much, be fine, much beyond um, what, what um, the leader has ever imagined. So in Guatemala in 1944, for example, you know, the urban middle class leaders of the revolution weren't really interested in my demands for land at that time, nor were they really interested in expanding citizenship fully to you indigenous peoples. And yet Mayas were consistently using those opportunities to push the, the state much beyond um, what was originally envisioned. And that's some of the extraordinary archival research that I was talking about. Julie has found these documents where clearly Kekchi petitioners who are attempting to get access to land through the agrarian reform are not um, abiding by the bureaucratic norms of those requests, which would indicate that they should say X amount of land is unused, therefore it's subject to expropriation and redistribution to us. But instead, they're drawing on a much longer history of dispossession and um, a uh, sense of injustice in order to petition for certain lands because that is the landowner that dispossessed my great, 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 et cetera. So this is just some of the archival research that you can find. And so the book is really unusual and must have been uh, uh, quite a writing challenge, honestly, um, for what I see as it's kind of double vision because you are constantly trying to move back and forth between um, what is most obvious in the archive, which is a you know, national perspective or a local kind of a local Ladino or German perspective on time, as you just said, or labor, which is another issue that comes up throughout the book. So you're on the one hand, you have that perspective, which is easier to find in the archives. On the other hand, you are always attempting to get at to the extent possible, a Kekchi notion of time, which you've just addressed somewhat, but also labor. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about writing with that double vision out of the very unequal sources that are available and what kind of notions of labor and labor reciprocity will help us um, revise our understanding of forced labor in Guatemala, which is a hugely important theme. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. It's like, it was one of the most challenging parts of writing the book was trying to keep all these perspectives at play. And, um, you know, my, my advisor, Florence M. Allen, had written um, Courage, Taste of Blood. And I remember having many conversations with her about how difficult it was to write a narrative. And then stupidly, I thought I could do it, right? <laughs> I was like, yeah, no problem, I got that. <laughs> um, and it is it's just like actually quite challenging to do that. Um, but with the question of time, you know, I don't think that it's so much that there that there's an opposition between Kekchi and Ladino times as if they were always different or opposed. Um, Kekchi patriarchs often, for example, articulated ideas of time that were associated with like progress, civilization, liberal democratic meta narrative, and and yet at other times and places they articulated ideas of time that were much more grounded in the relations of solidarity and reciprocity that were in the heart of indigenous social relations. 
or they articulated ideas of cyclical time associated with you know, mountain deities or Maya, the Maya calendar, for example. So it wasn't like sort of like one kind of time for one kind of person or people, um, but the different situations uh, led to them to evoke different ways of thinking about time and even about history. And in that sense, the archival question is really crucial. Um, and so I deployed like a sort of two pronged strategy, one which was um, like Isla and, and Laura Stoller reading an, along the archival grain, right? That is that you seek to show the power inherent within the archive itself. Uh, that is what it, the archive constructs and silences. And then reading against the the grain and you know the subaltern study mode, where you assess those moments where the archive reveals things that it might not have intended, um, and then you know having a kind of ethnographic land uh, lens almost. So, for example, um, when I was reading archival documents um, from land surveying records um, in the 19th century, when there's you know this wave of liberal land privatization going on. I was looking at how um, I was reading those documents and, um, you know, reading them in full, not just for the amount of land awarded to whom and, and so forth, but actually reading them. And I saw that, that the, the Kekchi petitioners of the lands um, would go about and they would go in these groups um, to survey the land and they would name all these places that were um, crosses and mountain tops and churches like these little ermitas and all these things that had symbolic value for um like in an, in an indigenous way that were actually also um, markers of the tutsutuka the mountain spirit and so by reading along and against the archival grain and with a kind of ethnographic lens, I could think about the ways that we could might also see them as if as marking, not just randomly <laughs> where these places were, but that those meaning, there might've been other meanings at play. Um, and so it's like those kinds of things that you have to sort of engage to capture um, the multiple meanings at play in any archival document, what the records might foreclose and disclose. And over time, I also was interested in how those, those sort of indigenous markers gradually became less and less important um, and erased from land survey titles, for example. Um, so yeah, that's, that's you, more. <laughs> that's super interesting. So you've mentioned the mountain deities and I wanted to ask you about a couple of the other non-human entities in the book. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk to us about El Kek or uh, Shukaneb, the, the frost and the kind of di divergent, or sometimes, as you say, I don't want to overemphasize the extent to which the book poses these two different views as divergent. Often they converge, right? Like, so in surveying the mountain deity, cr the crosses marking where hill deities um, reside might line up nicely with the surveying boundaries, right? In the same way that we use rivers or something like that to demarcate boundaries. So I don't want to overemphasize the the conflict um, or the the divergence, right? But I'm wondering if you could tell us why you include, you know, how you found out about El Kek and why you included that in your account of um, the particularly vicious form of uh, racial capitalism that grew up on some of the um, coffee plantations in this region. Yeah, okay, it, which is totally fascinating. Um, so I was doing this this interview, oral history interview with a old elderly catchy man who had been a caporal in one of the German coffee plantations. And um, sort of he just, he was telling me all these stories about life on the German coffee plantations as a caporal. And um, all of a sudden he like started telling me about the El Que. And I was like, what the hell <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, <laughs> and, and, and then, it, you know, he told me he was, you know, this half man, half cow, and he told me the origin story about how a German coffee planter had sex with a cow and it produced LK and because he had, it was a product of this relationship between a German coffee planter and a cow, it was the German planter owned it, and the LK was, his job was to police the plantation, and, and so, once I had heard this one story, I sort of asked other people about El Que and everyone's like, everyone has a story and everyone has like some 
way of explaining it. And at first I was just like, this is really fascinating, um, you know, and I, I didn't really know what to make of it. But then ultimately, as I sort of unpacked the book and thought about the book more, um, I began to think about how LK, um, you know, uh, offered a, a catchy window into uh, racial capitalism and, you know, to place LK alongside Marx, right, as a philosophical interpretation of capitalism from a Kekchi perspective. And so if you read, you know, Marx often operates via, you know, metonyms, right, a set of interchangeable commodities and that leads to a process of, of alienation. LK operates, I think, through metaphor. And the metaphors reveal um, the centrality of um, violence, including sexual violence, to coffee plantation worlds um, and to the construction of what I call a plantation sovereignty. Um, and so there's many elements of El Que um, and the stories that are told about him that say, that are just laden with meaning about what, it, what it's like to live um, on, on a plantation and what racial capitalism is like in Alta Vera Paz. And so the decision to allow um, El Que uh, to frame how I interpreted um, racial capitalism in, in Alta Vera Paz was to place Kekchi interpretations on the same level playing as an equal playing field with, um, you know, Marx or Western ideas about how capitalism functions. And um, it was to, yeah, to, to, to read Kekchi um, worlds as, as philosophical interpretations and to give them the weight of intellectuals. In other instances, like with um, the event that Rachel mentioned about um, Tsutsuka Shukanap, which is this powerful frost that happens in 1886 and that wipes out the coffee um, plantations. And is it, it's interpret, the cross is interpreted by many as having been brought by Tutsutuga Shukana, the most powerful mountain deity, and that he had been called upon by um, a, an alliance between a Ladino um, and um, some rural Kekchis to seek revenge for coffee production and private property. And that, of course, you know leads to a major rebellion. Uh, basically, people are fleeing their labor obligations. The countryside is militarizing. And there's all these really interesting things going on. Um, but the, the, by incorporating Tutsutuka Shukanap within the story, what I was trying to do was to um, show also Kekchi interpretations and Ladino interpretations of historical causation and say, we can't just think of these non-human actors as, you know, superstition, right? They actually had power and weight in the world and that we should take that seriously. And when we do, we get a very different way of seeing the aftermath of the frost and what it meant to people at the time. So in a way, both of those, those um, the inclusion of those non-human actors is a way of disrupting um, our sort of Eurocentric norms about the writing of history itself. And I, I love that one of the Kekchi subversive acts was to reclaim parts of the coffee plantations, rip out the coffee plants and plant milpa, plant cornfields, which of course is not just a matter of subsist subsistence agriculture, but also a matter of spiritual import. And, and, and that one of the threats of El Que I can't, uh, mispronouncing it, um, was uh, not just that he would prowl the, or it would prowl the plantation at night, but that it would, it had this voracious appetite for eggs, which is a kind of symbol that's so transparent that it almost doesn't require interpretation, right? Like I, as soon as I read that in the book, I thought, wow, that's, that really speaks to the view of the, not just material disruptions and dispossession and the kind of violence of, um, uh, a kind of Marxist accumulation, but also the interruption of social life, social reproduction, fertility, et cetera. Um, so I am mindful of the time. I have many, many more questions, but maybe maybe we should begin to open it out. And if people are 
quiet or shy coming up with their first questions, I'll continue with mine, but I wanted to give the opportunity to others as well. Um, so if, if you'd like to, to join the discussion, make a comment or ask a question, um, you can use the raise hand function or you can type into the chat. Um, I'm happy to, to read people's questions aloud, but you can also just type, I have a question um, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Um, and maybe Rachel, if you wanna ask one more question while people are sort of right. starting to think yeah. about what they might ask. I'll, I'll take advantage to, to um, ask Julie about one more in my mind, very major intervention that the book is making, because on the one hand, we're getting this very local perspective from Alta Verapaz, convincingly made with the argument that this is central to understanding this period of, of Guatemalan history. On the other hand, you're reintroducing some global conflicts that are often left out of Guatemalan history, which is framed in terms of Cold War violence. So I'm wondering if you could walk us through your intervention on the agrarian reform, because this really changed my way of thinking about it. Um, it by bringing back in World War II and the earlier expropriations of properties belonging to German nationals, um, it led me to look at the agrarian reform in a whole new way, particularly once you said, if you look at the agrarian reform as a whole in Guatemala and you leave to one side the United Fruit Properties, the place that saw the, the highest number and the most uh, hectares of land expropriated was Alta Verapaz. So could you take us through that a little bit? I found this extremely interesting and, and extremely new, I, I should say. Yeah, so it was it was sort of shocking almost in in the the research and writing of the book that you know I, I also never really considered this um, because when the typical histories of the agrarian reform in Guatemala are told from 1952 when the agrarian reform began, but the thing it, thing is that people didn't really think about the fact that there had been this previous nationalization around World War II, and so what happened on the eve of the revolution itself. And so um, after Jorge Ubico gets, you know, ousted he, and his interim drum, um, president uh, is appointed, um, Federico Ponce Valles, who um, is from Alta Verapaz, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the things that he does in August of 1944, like two months before the Guatemalan Revolution, is um, he nationalizes all of the German plantations. And I was, as I was mentioning, um, you know, prior to World War II, the majority of coffee production was in the hands of Germans. And so that was no small deal. Um, and that instantly set off, unleashed a massive, massive um, public debate. Uh, like it's plastered all over the newspapers um, for months about what to do with these nationalized properties. Because in World War I, the properties had been intervened by the state. And Ubico in, during World War II had intervened the state. They hadn't nationalized the properties, which is very different. And so this nationalization, also set off a wave of dissent um, and mobilization among rural peasants. And um, a big part of that, obviously, um, helped to offset um, and to actually lead to the revolution of four, in October of 44, because um, the urban, largely middle class leaders of the revolution were actually afraid of what was going on in the countryside. And um, but once the revolution came into power, then they weren't really interested in redistributing these properties to the rural Mayas who were already demanding them and believing that they should be redistributed them, in part because many of these people, if Alta Veda Pass is an indicator, had strong historical memories of losing the land in the 19th century by, by a illegitimate and violent means. And so they saw themselves as rightful owners and thought that the revolution that was in the name of the people and like a revolution should be giving the land to the rural Mayas. So the, already in 1944, before the revolution even be, gets going, there's already this rural mobilization that's happening. The state on the other hand, then you ended up, the revolutionary state ended up using the nationalized plantations as a system of political patronage. All over the, the archival records, you have people writing in and requesting as loyalty to the revolution and to um, you know, the, the political party that they get um, appointed as, 
you know, a director or, or some sort of um, of a national plantation. And so the, the state very much uses them to their benefit, but that doesn't stem the tide of the revolution from below that I talk about that has been bubbling and bursting at the seams. Um, and that um, becomes worse when German settlers begin returning in the, the 19, in after basically about 1947, 48. Um, and by the time 1952 comes, you know, there's already, there's been a, more than a decade, you know, almost a decade of mobilization for agrarian reform from below. And so it is on nationalized plantations, then you get the most um, mobilization um, for the reform and, and it, it, it takes pay, um, pay very quickly. So, yeah. Great, a we'll, couple of questions. Yeah. we'll take a question from Tom Rath first. Hi, I'm just turning my camera on. Thank you so much. This, this is really fascinating. It's so, so much to, 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 to digest. Um, I'm just thinking about the LK and kind of getting my head around that. Um, it, I've got maybe two questions. Is that all right, Christine? Um, one, I just wanted to, could you tell us a bit more about the concept of the, the improved race, the Raza Mejorada? And I'm just interested how much, do we see that main, like when is that mainly sort of emerging and do you read that as a sort of response and adaptation of kind of European social you know, biological racism, social Darwinism, or is it something which has longer roots in racial ideas going back to the colonial period and caste and things like that? How, how do we understand that concept historically? That's the first question. And um, second question is, I, I want, because you know, you're talking about ideas of time and progress and backwardness and so on, which is so interesting. Um, do you see in Guatemala uh, something, a kind of equivalent of what Rebecca Earl termed the Indianesque, this tendency in the 19th century that you certainly see in Mexico and lots of other places to say, okay, you know, before, you know, the 14th, 14th century, these civilizations were amazing and, and and then they kind of degenerated through the colonial period and, and unfortunately they're now backward. You know, is there an equivalent of that or, or is that something that you don't really see in Guatemala? Those are my questions. Um, yeah, so La Raza Mi Jordada, I'm, in, in my work at least, I trace it to uh, the 1930s and the rise of German National Socialism um, because that's a moment in which um, this, Kekchi Charmin and group of interracially mixed peoples really comes into its own. Um, and it comes into its own in the 1930s for, for several reasons. One is like German settlement had been long enough that they were sort of a, a group. And the other was because um, Jorge Ubico himself, he was looking to displace um, Kekchi patriarchs from positions of political power um, within the state. And he replaced them with these Kekchi Germans. And so they find themselves in like new positions of political power um, locally. At the same time, you know, the German government sent over um, to Guatemala, um, you know, these military officers who were medical doctors to study racial degeneration in the tropics, who very much conclude um, that the Kekchi Germans are dangerous because they're racially mixed and who you know, who do they really affiliate with, right? Are they German or are they Kekchi and, and Guatemalan? And then the other part of it is, and, and yet also really believe that they had it actually were improving the race. And so you begin to see this, this discourse of um, racial improvement and this kind of celebration of being racially improved. And I think it, um, gets re-articulated in, in the post-war period, particularly with the rise of the Pan Maya movement um, and this desire to have an identity, right? I mean, I think one of the, the, the things that um, people like Charlie Hill for, have brought up, for example, is that Ladinos are, you know, sort of like, we're lost, we have no identity in this post-war period where the Pan Maya movement is like so powerful, it, you know, in claiming an, a, a cultural identity and authenticity. And um, it was it was sort of at that moment that a lot of I think Ger Kekchi Germans also began to say, "Hey, we are our own group. We are German, and we are Kekchi." Um, and to, to have you know to lay claim partly to the authentic 
authenticity question and also to it's powerful because then they don't get associated with the racial backwardness of being indigenous which sort of leads to your other question about um rebecca earl's fabulous work um and absolutely i mean i think that you know um Guatemala is, is exactly like much of Latin America in that sense that there's this notion that, um, you know, these great Maya civilizations had were had ceased and what was left was a, essentially a degenerate race that was backward, um, that was not capable of citizenship, that needed to be forced um, to labor in order to be civilized. Um, and so there is that sort of constant double play um, at work. And, and I think that that's, you know, for, for people who study indigenous politics more broadly, it's so common to, on the one hand, celebrate and glorify indigenous culture, indigenous civilizations, and then on the other hand, to suggest that contemporary indigenous peoples were, were racially degenerate. Um, and that as a legacy of colonialism that had to be overcome. Back when we could all still travel, I had the opportunity to go to the beauty contest that you mentioned uh, in Kowan. And this is a phenomenon that is still ongoing where people come, uh, are, you know, there, there are beauty queens who have had a long political trajectory, including an insurgent trajectory during the civil war. Um, but if you go to the beauty contest in Kowan, uh, indigenous peoples are wearing uh, not just the Kekchi, uh, Traje, so the, the very recognizable clothing, but more specific festival clothing from their particular villages. And there's a very um, uncomfortable colonial, you don't even want to call it neo-colonial uh, audience uh, and set of judges who are mostly German Kekchi or Ladino judging the, the beauty. And then of course the racism in the region is endemic as an ongoing problem. So it's not as if by elevating the beauty of the um, the traditional clothing people are given concurrent social status. Anyway, I, I loved reading about the history of that in this book because I actually was was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, super. We'll take another question from Vaclav Masek. Oh, I think you're muted. Hi. Yeah, it, it looks like you're unmuted, but we're having trouble hearing you. We can't hear you. Do, you. do you want to try to type your question into the chat? Yeah, we, we can't hear you. So Vaka, I would suggest either leaving the meeting and rejoining or typing your question into the chat. Or try mm -hmm. without that. Then now we oh, can hear you. I was about great. to say, try without the headphones. It can there be we go, yes. <laughs> I'm a first year PhD student in sociology from Guatemala. I'm a big fan of your work. And I was wondering what your historical research can teach us about how the state sees indigenous communities in Altavera Paz as rebellious and insurrectionary. Uh, and I wanna bring a contemporary event to sort of contextualize this question. And it's the case of Bernardo Caal Chol. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with. He's a Kekchi Mai indigenous leader and a Guatemalan human rights defender who has been considered a prisoner of conscience uh, and has been wrongfully imprisoned for over two years now. Uh, since 2015, Bernardo Caal has defended the rights of the communities in Santa Maria Caon, um, who has been who have been affected by the construction of a hydroelectric plant in the Ochec and Caon rivers in the northern department of Alta Verapaz, where your research has taken place. He filed a series of injunctions against the project in 2017, uh, and the high courts in Guatemala actually acknowledged that the community had a, a, a right to free prior and informed consultation. Um, and that right was violated. So my question again is, uh, what is the state's historical relationship with, Kek with the Kekchi community teaches us about the current moment? And I guess in other ways, uh, my question would be why those who speak out to defend the rights or human rights continue to be criminalized in Guatemala? And thank you. Um, yeah, that's a really important question. And I think um, when I was talking about the politics of postponement before, one of the things that um, I emphasize in the book is that um, when we talk, it's, it's very easy to see the politics of postponement everywhere, right? And to see um, it's often violent implications, the way that it can 
can criminalize or create as subversive or um, as insurrectionary, as you put it, um, indigenous peoples, uh, one way uh, that it operates. But what it's also um, in the historical record, often more difficult to find, but, but I think is absolutely crucial is to see all those moments that the politics of postponement isn't just random. <laughs> you know, it arises precisely at the moments when indigenous peoples um, are articulating political projects that the state or, or state officials or coffee planters um, or intellectuals are finding very difficult. And that is that is contradictory to whatever their aims um, might be. And that the way of foreclosing the project is to, to call it um, insurrectionary or to, to call them not yet ready or to postpone them in different ways. And I think the insurrectionary, the notion of the insurrectionary Indian like Charles Hale has also talked about has this longer genealogy um, that, that um, gets, that works out. And I think that um, it's really also one of the other things that makes Alta Vera Pass slightly different than some other regions in Guatemala. And that has to do with a longer history of mediation or indigenous elites roles as mediators. So in pl some places like Quetzaltenango, um, which Greg Grandin worked on, um, and he wrote the, the you know marvelous book, Blood of Guatemala. And he showed that how in Quetzaltenango, <clears throat> these indigenous elites became essentially allies of the state, right? And they engaged in an internal civilizing process um, and in order to bolster their status as elites within Maya society. In Alta Vera Pass, it's very different and it works very differently in part because the way that coffee plantation capitalism expands in the region is right on top of indigenous communities. And so indigenous elites find themselves in the position of being, um, you know, of, of facing Ladinos and Germans as competition for land and labor. And as part of that process, they more often became um, allies of the rural classes via, not by internal civilizing, although there was some of that, um, but more often by defending um, the, the rights of lower class Mayas, of defending um, them for over questions of like forced labor or access to land. And so in Alta Vera Pass, there's a very long tradition of indigenous leaders as a, you know, as, um, basically who take, who are indigenous, um, usually more for like indigenous elites who um, use their role as mediation and, and the relations of reciprocity and solidarity within indigenous communities to make a defense for indigenous rights. And that's where I think that you get figures like Cal and it's also I think where the state ends up responding with violence and treating um, indigenous peoples as insurrectionary. Um, and that <clears throat> is sort of like, like I think that the, the politics of postponement also operates on a sort of scale, right? A scale of violence. There's the violence of like um, saying you're not yet ready for citizenship. And so we're going to ignore your demands for um, free wage labor. Or we're gonna ignore your demands for education or, or whatever those sort of soft demands are. And then there's like indigenous people are insurrectionary. <laughs> and that's what you see also in like 1886 six around the coffee frost, right? Um, when there are, when these these fault lines become really, really strong. And so I think that Alta Vera Pass has this very long history in which relations of mediation um, work out slightly different than they do in some places like Quetzaltenango. Um, and then also the fact of the matter that the um, Alta Vera Pass is also extremely rich in resources. And um, so hydroelectric dams and mines, which are um, really um, um, important um, you know, right now also sort of fall upon the region. Um, yeah. Thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, well, I'll take a question from Paula first. 
Thank you. Uh, it's just a, a small question for, for clarification. What, what happened to, to the German landowners after that, their land was um, expropriated, I guess? Were they, were they deported to, to the US as, as happened to the Japanese in, in Peru? And, and if not, did, did they remain a sort of political or social force in, in Guatemala? Um, yeah, so um, Germans in World War II, some of them anyway, were um, deported and interned in the United States um, in a couple of different locations. And then um, they were returned to Germany. Some of them had, you know, never been to Germany. <laughs> They'd been born in Guatemala and yet, you know, were returned to Germany. And some of those made their way back to Guatemala um, in about 47, 48. Some of them were able to get their lands back um, and some of them just sort of restarted in new ways. After the war though, I think, um, you know, before World War II, um, Germans were very insular in, in some ways in their political communities. They, I mean, they were intermarrying with um, Kekchis and other kinds of things and they were not, you know, politically or socially insular in any like exact sense, but they had German clubs and German societies and they, um, uh, you know, maintain German language and they often return to Germany um, on trips and so forth. Uh, after World War II, there's a much more concerted effort to um, integrate into Guatemalan society and they really start to intermarry with um, German, with Guatemalan elite families. And so, um, yeah, you, you, and the German club remains sort of, and the German school in Guatemala City remains sort of very elite status type things. Um, and so, and yet still in Alta Vera Pass, there's also all these um, people who were, um, you know, from mixed race families. That, that still are there that have a sort of a German identity. Um, and some of them now are also reclaiming that and because they have access to German citizenship because <clears throat> Germany has such strange citizenship laws mm. and they're, they go back to Germany to study and so forth. <clears throat> I was really interested to read about how one of the German families that's most associated with coffee production, the Dieseldorf, managed to weasel their way both out of expropriation and deportation. I don't know if you want to say how they did that. I was surprised by that story, actually. Yeah, so, um, well, Germans were like, were principally, um, you know, it wasn't straightforward Nazi affiliation that led to Germans getting interned, for example. You know, like less than half of the local Nazis were actually sent abroad. And, and so the people that did get sent into the internment camps were, you know, anti-Nazi, they might have been social Democrats, they might have been Jewish, like, you know, it really was not um, like about, you know, <laughs> about clear political affiliation. And so Erwin Paul Dillesdorf, who is a, one of the largest landowners in the region, um, was very astute. And then, his, and then his son, who followed him, um, and through the war, uh, he well, one on the one hand, um, he was of Jewish descent, um, or at least, and and received a lot of um, Nazi like anti, um, you know, death threats basically um, during the war. But he basically um, donated a ton of money to various forms of charity um, and declared himself in favor of the revolution. He, um, you know, basically did anything that he possibly could to make himself appear on the side of democracy and to be anti fascist. And eventually, then his family um, also sides with you, the United States and. Um, the military, the, the coup that happens in 1954. And so he's very astute at sort of playing his cards right so that he actually, his properties never got expropriated um, at all, um, despite always, being a really huge landowner. Yeah. I always think that, you know, all history is family history, but especially in Guatemala, you know, um, and there are also another archival material that you found that is extraordinary are the petitions of Kekchi women and their Kekchi German sons who had been abandoned by Germans in Alta Verapaz, 
once the German administrator on another coffee plantation perhaps made enough money that he could open his own coffee plantation, they would abandon the common law Kekchi wife and get married in a more proper way to a supposedly proper way to someone of German descent or someone in many cases who directly migrated from Germany to marry that individual. So after expropriations, Julie found this amazing material of Kekchi women uh, writing to the state, trying to uh, get some claim or some purchase on land or property after the expropriations and appealing to the state for protection. I found that fascinating. I didn't know those stories either. Yeah, it's really good. Anyway, I don't know. Do we have other uh, yeah. questions? I might ask a, ask a question myself, if you guys don't mind. Um, we've been talking a little bit about periodization and the way that this kind of story of the nationalizations um, during World War II perhaps helps us understand the agrarian reform differently. And I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more, Julie, about how you think about 1954 as a kind of turning point or these kind of issues of continuity and change across that boundary, particularly drawing on your findings from other Um, Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so I edited this volume as well, uh, well with Heather Verana and, a big part of the, the point of the volume was to dissenter 1954 <laughs> and say like, we need, we need to like calm down <laughs> and, um, you know, look at the revolution from other perspectives that are not simply about understanding how 1954 came to be. Um, and, and in that sense, I think, um, you know, like 1954 is, is, is an incredibly important watershed and certainly um, sets a tone for a lot of things. And it is, you know, ultimately where um, I end the book. Um, but I, um, you know, I think that we can't allow 1954 to set, set the stage for how we understand the whole of the revolution, the revolutionary period. There was a lot of things going on that have, you know, that did not, were not set or determined by the military coup and the agrarian reform. Um, and that if we ignore, if we, if we only think about trying to understand how 1954 came to be, what we really lose out is all these other revolutions that were at play and all of these other dynamics um, that were going on at the same time. And in the same way, I think if you only center 1954 in your analysis, um, we would also miss a lot of the continuities that occur after. And one of them is the German plantations. Like those, you know, after 1954, they return to being nationalized pro properties, right? Um, that, that, quick, that happens quite quickly. And, um, you know, some, in some instances, the Germans are able to get them, but most often, in fact, those nationalized properties then fall into the hands of military either um, are turned into co-ops as kind of a populist appeal to give indigenous peoples land, or they are um, and turned over to the hands of military officers, which is hence how you get Benedicto Lucas Garcia, who I started with marrying a Kekchi German woman. Um, that's exactly how. Um, and um, so there's also these, there's also historical patterns that, that sort of transcend 54. Yeah. And in light of all the earlier history that you're telling in the book, all of a sudden it does not, it's still jarring, but it doesn't seem quite so strange that Benedicto Lucas Garcia, this general who is most associated with the genocide um, in Guatemala, has a common law Kekchi wife um, and speaks Kekchi, or at least some, right? So that's what might seem very striking and, and hard to understand for someone who's just focused on 1954 as a detonating event for all of the violence that comes afterwards. Once you see the kind of longer trajectory, particularly of German Kekchi interaction and German extraction of Kekchi forced labor as a potential antecedent to the um, poles of development, which is a very um, interesting argument or suggestion that, that Julie also makes in the book, right? That, this, that you're drawing on a much longer pattern of Kekchi, outs not outside, Kekchi German and then Kekchi Ladino interaction and um, forced labor surveillance, um, you know, uh, reduction into um, 
into a kind of space that's more easily surveilled as part of the poles of development, which we've previously understood for those who don't know the poles of development were where captured indigenous peoples during the most violent period of the Guatemalan civil war were concentrated so that the army could surveil them, right? Um, and so those have previously been understood in reference to the cold war and in reference to US techniques in Vietnam, for example. But what Julie is showing is that there's a longer history of forced labor surveillance um, and extraction of Kekchi forced labor um, in the very regions where this is happening uh, during the Civil War. So I found that really illuminating as well. Yeah. Great. We have time for one or two more questions if anyone wants to type into the chat or raise your hand or Rachel, if you'd like to ask another question, you're welcome to I have as a well. final one, but I'd rather hear so if someone else, I don't want to cut the line of said better Lauren. Yeah. Lauren. Hi, um, this has been a really interesting discussion. I just wanted to go back to something that was said on double vision. And I was just wondering if you ran into any limita limitations when talking about different ontologies whilst writing in a linear historical structure. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, a, it's a very hard thing to keep at play. Um, because in many respects, it's completely you know, opposed. And, and so I try to use all these moments um, with the, the 1886 frost, for example, to sort of disrupt the narrative, right? And to disrupt our historical causation. And I also use this um, concept of, of time knots to show how, how the past um, is never fully complete. Um, that time accumulates rather than passes and to show that the, there's these events um, and these moments in time where with the past, the present and the future sort of all conglomerate into a knot that is very contested. Um, and that is to, to kind of disrupt any sort of sense of a linear notion of time. At the same time, it's like, it's a traditional academic book <laughs> you know, that follows particular structures of um, ways of being. And, and so um, it's also limited um, the extent to which I fully incorporate a lot of those things. Um, and I think also, you know, I make these gestures towards including indigenous peoples um, as intellectual interlocutors, like by thinking about El K as, as a way of, uh, as, as, a, as a way of thinking about capitalism. Um, but it's only so far, uh, it only goes so, so far, right? I'm not actually engaging in a full collaboration with my um, interlocutors. And so I think that um, the nature of our academic writing sometimes places particularly, um, you know, a dissertation um, that then becomes a book. Um, it sets limits on the kinds of ways that we can write um, as well. So, um, but it, it's, yeah, so it's definitely a challenging thing to, to undertake. Um, and, and then same thing with a narrative that is multivocal. Um, it's not easy to write from multiple perspectives and yet to, to maintain a, a narrative art that's understandable. So, and I'm, I'm not sure, like maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't achieve it. I'm either. here to say it's, 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 <laughs> it's, like maybe, it's very, it didn't work out. I don't know. <laughs> it works, it works very well. And the other, the additional layer, which we haven't mentioned as much is that Julie really contends with the fear that you can feel dripping from some of these archival sources that it, when you get a perspective on, or some glimpse of a indigenous perspective, perhaps in some of the older periods, right? So you can't interview someone from the 19th century, alas. Um, although most of us dream of that probably as historians. Um, what you see in the archive is that it's overlaid with this heavy fear of racial uprising, right? Motines de Indios in the, in the classic uh, formulation where it's very hard to discern what the demands are, being, are that are being put forward sometimes because they are misinterpreted or they are misread or they are feared to be um, that the indigenous people are gonna rise up and kill all of the non-indigenous people. And so you very carefully kind of go through and dis try to disaggregate what's rumor, what's rumor that tells us something, right? Not to be discarded, but what's rumor, what is fear, what is actual event and what is possibly demand from yeah. below. 
Well, I think we'll kind of um, draw the, the formal proceedings to a close here. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that our final meeting of the, this academic year will be in two weeks from today on March 16th with Patricio Simoneto and Ernesto Seman. So I hope everyone will join us for that. Please register on the IHR website. Um, and um, uh, Julie and Rachel and I will stay logged on for a few minutes after if anyone wants to ask a few more questions or just chat informally. Um, but before, before we kind of formally bring this to a close, please join me in thanking both Rachel and Julie and congratulating Julie on what is really a magnificent book. Thank you.